finally, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Patrick Deneen. Patrick holds a PhD in political philosophy from Rutgers University. From 1995 to 1997, he was a speechwriter and special advisor to the director of the United States Information Agency. Since then, he's taught at both Princeton and Georgetown before joining the faculty of Notre Dame as a professor of constitutional studies. He is the author and editor of numerous books, including his most recent, Why Liberalism Failed, which reached number four on the Amazon bestseller list for political philosophy, sandwiched between Machiavelli's The Prince and Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Critics have compared Patrick to the prophet Jeremiah and called his book bracing, electrifying, sobering, courageous, timely, and radical. And I am convinced that he is one of the most important and prescient thinkers of our day. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our contributing editor, dear friend and keynote speaker, Dr. Patrick J. Deneen. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. I do want to say that it actually reached number one for one day uh, in works for political theory, which is a very small part of the Amazon world. It's wonderful to be back here in Washington, D.C., even though I remember why I left it, 90 degree weather in the beginning of May. We don't have that in South Bend right now. Uh, I also remember, uh, as an assistant professor, uh, roughly about halfway through my time at Princeton University, a time, and those of you who are in the academy or know of the academy, a time when you sort of try to keep your head down. When I first read some of the reports that, uh, uh, that we just heard about of, the, uh, of this new journal that was being uh, brought out, rolled out, uh, the American Conservative, and thinking that I would really like to write for this journal someday. Uh, maybe, maybe after I got tenure. Uh, when I read of its core commitments, uh, commitments to a modest republic and its stance toward foreign policy, a concern for the working class and the common man and its economic commitments, and support for traditional values uh, for a social order that rests on the norms and beliefs conveyed especially through the main religious traditions in America, the Judeo-Christian inheritance, that these three elements that formed, I think, the base of the self-understanding and the project of the American conservative, this was a project I thought I could sign on to when it was safe to do so. I was eventually invited by Dan McCarthy, and I'm very grateful to Dan for the invitation to start writing some articles and reviews for the journal. And then when it began its online uh, uh, venture uh, to write a regular column, which I wrote for several years, um, and to also serve as a contributing editor. Uh, this was a, was a great honor and a great delight for me. But tonight, to deliver a keynote address, uh, having pulled out my old tuxedo, I haven't worn it since I left D.C. seven years ago, had to get a little bit uh, alterations. This is, for me, a real pinch-me moment. Uh, it feels both to me and maybe, in a way, the American conservative, that this is a night that uh, both it and I have come of age. It's an evening to take stock. What does it mean to be an American conservative? Now, it has long been suggested, and I've just written a book about this subject, that America is a liberal nation. We only need to look, for example, at the book, uh, a book uh, well known at its time, uh, by Lionel Trilling called The Liberal Imagination, published in 1950, to encounter this argument. Let me just give you a sense of what Trilling argued. This is a quote from that book. Quote, in the United States at this time, liberalism is not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition. For it is the plain fact that nowadays there are no conservative or reactionary ideas in general circulation. This does not mean, of course, that there is no impulse to conservatism or to a reaction. Such impulses are certainly very strong, perhaps even stronger than most of us know, but the conservative impulse and the reactionary impulse do not, with some isolated and some ecclesiastical exceptions, express themselves in ideas, but only in action or in some irritable mental gestures which seek to resemble ideas. Now, this was the 
This was the received and indeed the, the, the could say the elite opinion at the time. But Hartz, uh, sorry, in this case, uh, Lionel Trilling, and then later, five years later, Louis Hartz in a book called The Liberal Tradition in America, a Harvard professor, both articulated something, a kind of an argument that I think we have generally encountered through much of American history, that the only tradition in America, think of Hartz's book, The Liberal Tradition in America, the only tradition in America has been a tradition that is at its heart anti-traditional. That liberalism at its core, as Hartz articulated, is a tradition that seeks in many ways to dismantle the influence of tradition in the world, and in particular, to give a place of pride to individual choice and individual self-making. What arguments such as this at the time of the middle of the century suggest is that this magazine's title and the cause for our celebration tonight is something of an oxymoron that there may not in fact be anything called American conservatism. This is in some ways to suggest, if Trilling was right, that the operating system of America has always been liberal, has always sought to, in some ways, disassemble tradition and custom and inheritance to liberate people from anything that is given in preference for that which is chosen. And that, as a result, all of the efforts, you could say, to support a kind of conservative world have generally gone bad. That over the nearly 40 years since the conservative ascendancies and since the time of Ronald Reagan, what do we have as a result? We have the expansive imperial project and the failure of what American conservative author Andrew Bacevich has called the war for the greater Middle East, uh, the war for the greater Middle East. We have an expanding and expansive state that that insinuates itself into every aspect of our lives today, including that deep state, that dark state of the national security uh, uh, portion. And we have the stunning decline of social and religious norms under the onslaught of popular culture in academe and in our schools that seems to only to reinforce the collapse of family formation and the waning influence of religious and cultural institutions. And this, for those of you who are looking for an uplifting evening after we uh, adjourn tonight, this is the subject of my recent book, Why Liberalism Failed. But here I want to suggest that in spite of all of the obvious, uh, the great distress of the republic over the recent election, the recent election actually gives me and perhaps should give us some reason to pause and even hope. And I'm not necessarily speaking about the man who was elected, but the in some ways, the, the forces that led to his election, but more importantly, the repudiation of, in many ways, the organized center of Washington, D.C. One conclusion of the election, it seems to me, that there actually remains a living and recognizable conservative tradition in America that has not been especially found in its political philosophy. In fact, it's found perhaps in what Trilling called its irritable gestures, the kind of actions or practices. As the song goes, it may turn out that all along we have looked for conservatism in all the wrong places. Where have we looked for conservatism? And in the last roughly 40 years, we tended to look for conservatism in this beast called fusionism, created by Frank Meyer along with William F. Buckley, that sought to combine three legs within the tradition of American political life to forge the modern stool of conservatism. And the three legs, surely well known to almost everyone, if not everyone in this room, were economic libertarianism, the, anti, uh, the anti-Soviet stance of the, of the hawks, what became the neoconservatives, and social conservatives, especially Protestant evangelicals and traditional Catholics and Jews. And yet, if we think about and examine these parts of these stools, what we see is that while all of these were, uh, were opposed and in very important ways to, com- to communism, all of the legs of this, this stool were not inherently conservative. At least two of the elements of this stool contained its own set of ideological commitments, liberal commitments. They would be recognizable to Lionel Trilling but that those ideological commitments were less evident while communism was the greatest threat. 
And in the years since the fall of communism, it seems to me that, the, uh, that these elements of these two parts of these legs have become more and more evident. Take, for instance, the first of these, the libertarian economic commitment. Libertarianism as a philosophy suggests that, the, that, that the, in the realm of economics, the, cal the calculus of the individual is supreme. The market is the accumulation of individual choices and should be left as free as possible without any external impediments and indeed has a tendency toward a global, uh, toward a global dimension. As such, it is relativistic. There are no given preferences in a market. The consumer is king. And what's interesting is the time I was coming of intellectual age, I was reading philosophers like Alan Bloom, who decried the relativism within the universities, the relativism of the professoriate. And yet conservatives embraced a relativistic economic philosophy that arguably was far more pervasive and shaping than that of the professoriate, or at least as consonant of the professoriate. As David Brooks pointed out in, a, I think, an important passage in his book on Paradise Drive, French Marxist postmodernists wearing uh, you know, uh, uh, the chapeau and smoking gitane and libertarian economists end up having much more in common than they realized. But lastly, this philosophy proved to be ideological, which is to say that it can't be contained simply within the economic market. It sought to redefine every aspect of life. Every aspect of life had to be subject to the philosophy that life needed to be organized around the choice of this free, unencumbered individual. And so areas of life that should not become markets, for example, the internal operations of schools, the, the effort of, for example, of the wise people in institutions, supposedly the elders of the institution, to create curricula, right? the tradition, to convey the tradition to the young, became subject to the forces of the market, so that at this point in time, it's very difficult for any institution to make the argument that there is a curriculum that students should follow because it is to the benefit of who they are and the kind of person that they should become. Rather, increasingly, it resembles a kind of cafeteria. Or think of the dating and sex market today, a place of unencumbered individuals freed from the old norms of courtship and dating but as a result, a kind of free-for-all, a place that was not meant to be that kind of a market. And we see arguments being made by authors today that this is simply, this logic will be extended ultimately, for example, to the choice of the kind of child you want to have, the features that you decide that your child will have as we, uh, as we advance our biotechnological ability to create the next generation. Think then also of the second part, the second leg of the stool, the neoconservative leg of the stool. Now, of course, there's nothing inherently ideological about opposition to the Cold War, but this particular constituency had been ideologues originally on the left. They were generally ex-communists, I think it's been suggested, and became in some ways liberal ideologues. It wasn't simply an opposition to communism, to communism that impelled many of these figures but a belief in the fundamental and universal truth of liberal democracy as the only legitimate political regime. And one only need only go back to 1989 and Francis Fukuyama's essay, The End of History, to encounter that argument. This perspective believed that the world could, ought, and should be remade in conformity with this natural truth. And thus, America became a very distinctive empire in the history of the world, not an empire that sought in some ways to impose itself upon recalcitrant nations or peoples while allowing for the continuance of those cultures. Right? The, the, the really good representation of this is the movie 300, if you've ever seen this movie. Right? You get all these soldiers from the, from the Persian Empire attacking the Greeks, and they all have different uniforms, right? because it's an empire, and it, it doesn't eliminate the difference of those cultures, uh, but it simply forces them to serve the empire. Rather, the American empire became a very distinct one, in which it sought to impose a single model upon all the peoples of the world, whether willing or unwilling. Thus, in the aftermath of the Iraq War, one conservative author, 
wrote a book called Mugged by Reality. When he realized that it was an old and forgotten conservative lesson, that it's difficult to remake a culture. And indeed, one probably ought not to do so. This was John Agresto, who said he'd forgotten uh, that he'd once read Edmund Burke. The third leg of the stool, the social and religious conservatives, I would submit, ended up being deeply compromised by the, the associations with the liberal ideologies of economic libertarianism and neoconservatism. Not only a tacit association of convenience, politics makes strange bedfellows, but many leaders within the social and religious conservative world undertook efforts to actively reconcile Christianity with an individualistic and materialistic economic worldview, one might mention Michael Novak, and to marry just war theory with liberal imperialism in order to place Christians on the side of neoconservatives. And here might one mention George Weigel. Now there are additional reasons for the fading legitimacy of Christianity in the eyes of many Americans. And here I think in particular the efforts of the left to undermine Christianity today. But I think we cannot underestimate this, the damage that this particular marriage did to Christianity in America without actually providing ballast, a kind of conservative ballast in conservatism. And again, let's look at the result. Some 30, 40 years after Reagan's victory, we had the collapse of, near collapse of the world economy, at least in significant part because of the deregulation of the financial sector, alongside an economy that had outsourced and downsized its way to a decimated working class and the enrichment of a small elite who now ran the country we had the ruins of the neoconservative dream of remaking the world, starting in Iraq in the hopes, as George W. Bush declared in his second inaugural address in January 2005, of the ultimate goal of ending tyranny in our world. And so we should not be surprised by the rapid collapse of religious faith and belief and its, illegitim its illegitimacy, especially in the eyes of a younger generation who are still suffering with the consequences of both the economic collapse and in many ways the Iraq war, with close to 50% of millennials now declaring an abandonment of religious belief altogether. My book argues that liberalism failed because liberalism succeeded. But I think it's also fair to say that conservatism failed because conservatism succeeded, at least in, in as much as it was liberal, to the extent that it, in ways you could say it defined itself in ways that were deeply liberal in that most ideological sense. But to recognize this fact should, in fact, be reason for some hope. If this form of so-called conservatism failed, its failure lies not because it was conservatism, but because it was not conservative enough. In particular, the first two legs of the stool ran directly against a conservative philosophy. If by conservative, we, under we understand and mean the preservation of a society that offers an and prefers stability and order, especially for ordinary people in a society. It's the ordinary people who benefit most from the cons conservation of social norms and an economic and political and military order that preserves stability and order and does not seek and value constant change, unsettlement, and dissipation as the core of economic and cultural orientation. Thus, in overturning this stable default, which I think has been done over the last half century, it would prove liberative to a few, while completely destabilizing the segment of society that has historically most needed stability, the ordinary people in the working class. For those like myself who live in these places, you need only look around with one's eyes to see the overwhelming evidence of this destruction. Or for those who live at the other side of the geographic divide, you only need to read a book like Charles Murray's Coming Apart to understand and begin to get a view of the social and economic decimation that we see across a wide swath of our fellow citizens today. And so I find, oddly enough, some hope amid this kind of catastrophe of politics of our time in this last election, which reflected a kind of modest revolution one that we see taking place across the developed world today. A pox on both your houses, center left and center right. One that has deconstructed a world for their own benefit. 
the so-called rise of populism, and notice the word populism is what is used by people usually living in Washington, D.C., when the, when the demos decide something that they don't like. Otherwise, it's called democracy. But this so-called rise of populism is, to my mind, a remarkable sign of hope and potential for restoration of a better and a truer conservatism. The populist wave we have seen around the world is precisely a rejection both of left and right liberalism in favor of a society that conserves. What was proposed in a very inarticulate way by an extremely inarticulate leader in our last election by our unrepresented countrymen was a new and truer conservatism and frankly the conservatism that was outlined in the American conservative 15 years ago. It proposed a different stool a different set of legs to the stool. In the first instance, an economy that serves the citizenry, not a few elites who themselves benefit from high rates of globalization, open borders, and the financialization of the economy. Now, while still inchoate and needing thoughtful development of policy, imagine if we put half of the amount of money put it into the think tanks in DC in developing an economic policy that benefited our countrymen this basic insight, it seems to me, is one that is very promising as precisely putting together a kind of coalition, a different kind of conservatism. Secondly, I think what we saw in the response to occasional moments in the campaign when a Republican candidate criticized the war in Iraq of a foreign policy that is conservative. The last election showed that a candidate who appealed to a conservative approach to foreign policy Above all, that great conservative awareness of unintended consequences and the un insufficiency and even danger of good intentions. That this could draw an enthous enthusiastic response, not from DC denizens, both left and right, but rather from the ordinary person who tends to serve in the military. This stance appeals to a long-standing disposition in the American tradition of reluctance to engage in what George Washington himself called foreign entanglements, that scourge of Republican self-government. And thirdly, social conservatism remained as the only part of the original stool crafted by mid-century architects of fusionism. And while it has an array of challenges, and you only need to read Rod Dreher's blog every day to see what these are, I think it's, it's fair to argue that Christianity's political association with economic libertarianism and neoconservatism was deeply compromising and undermined its witness, both in the views of those outside and beyond Christianity, but even those who attempted to justify this association from within. The conservatism then that was understood and launched by the architects of the, American conservative, of, of the American conservative 15 years ago was a combination of conservative elements, parts that fit really naturally together, aimed at the conservation of a stable and ordered way of life, particularly for what Aristotle called the great middling element of society, that is essence for Republican society. It is thus American conservatism conservative. At the same time, it draws on very old traditions within the American Republic, attenuated, yes, but old traditions and apparently still living traditions, particularly the democratic republicanism of the early republic, witnessed, for example, not only in our founders, but in the concerns by the anti-federalists who insisted on the inclusion of the Bill of Rights and a concern for the centralizing tendency of the Constitution, articulated in the Jeffersonian insistence that an economy needs to be composed above all of small-scale producers aimed at the preservation and strengthening of the family, and understanding that an economy must be ordered toward the preservation of good habits and neighborliness. Appealing to the Republican tradition of the citizen soldier enshrined in our Second Amendment, which embodies the suspicion toward a standing army, toward a professional army, and its aggrandizing use, particularly toward the glorification of members of the ruling class. And that long-standing populist suspicion toward the concentration of power, both in government and in the economy. This is American conservatism. So tonight, there's good reason to celebrate. <laughs> 
In 15 years, this small upstart magazine, as we heard tonight, has gone from the peripheries of respectability, doubtless the butt of jokes and slighting among the cognoscenti of this city and others, and now rightly celebrates its prescient anticipation of the future of conservatism in America, if there is to be one. It has been preparing for this moment for a decade and a half. The task now of shaping conservatism of today and of tomorrow, of developing, as Robert said, a guiding philosophy and articulating a better course for America that serves the American citizenry. It's really quite amazing to think of what has been accomplished in the last 15 years. And I think we can expect great things in the ne next 15 years. And I, for one, can't wait to see an America even more deeply shaped by the original vision of this little magazine. My thanks to its founders, to its many authors and its editors, and the supporters of this little magazine that could, that can, and that will. Please tell us how you really feel, Patrick. <laughs> I think he lived up. <laughs> I think he lived up to uh, the uh, Jeremiah <laughs> that he uh, was aptly described. Thank you for those remarks. Let's all give Patrick another round of applause. With that, I'd like to conclude our evening with two brief announcements. First, if you're interested in learning more about our Robert A. Nisbet Donor Society, which exists to fund much of the growth that we talked about tonight, please let me or one of the other staff members know, and I'll be happy to send you some information. And second, I'd like you to save the date for our second annual Crony Capitalism Conference on June 21st at the City View Room at George Washington University. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>